So we are looking at Land Before Time 7, Stone of Coal Fire. And I swear to God, every time, every time, I, I mean, I've watched these movies before, but I didn't realize to my full mental potential how much more distorted the movies become as time goes on. Something I also realized is they haven't quite graduated from the Windows XP screensaver graphics. Long, long time ago, when little blinky lights in big darkness even more shiny. This Petri sounds like a chalkboard gave birth to him. So he's telling the story about long time ago, and then we get this what in the ass crack. What ew, what why do they do that? I, I get this was the norm back then, but somebody must have realized how awful it looks because you have these two-dimensional cartoon dinosaurs. Cartoon dinosaurs flying around with this PNG 3D cutout. It looks so so freaking unnatural. And then the thing is, it draws more attention to itself than the flying reptiles. So you end up doing the opposite of what you want to do because the thing that really stands out to me is this random 3D object in a world full of 2D that's supposed to be a backdrop. The flyers. Oh my god, you see what I mean? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. So Petrie's telling the story, and he says his uncle Toronto is the one that told him how flyers were regal and everything that happened. <laughs> Jesus. And you can see here in the still shot that the animation has gone even more downhill. <laughs> I don't know how this is possible. Being that this movie is so much newer than the original, but the original looks better. They look like toilet seats made out of animal hide. <laughs> it's making me freaking nauseous. He tell me all about it when me just nest thing. Ah, <sighs> okay. I know. I know. It's gonna be one of those videos. If you guys watch my other Land Before Time videos, you would have heard me point out how Sarah looks, you know? Point out how gourmet Littlefoot's grandfather looks. I don't know why the newer people, like I just, have they seen the previous movies? Because there's just never ending available artwork for all the official Land Before Time characters available. And they draw Sarah's eyelids like this. Sarah's eyelids, Sarah has those little white circles around her eye, right? And when a dog or an animal has a white circle around their eye, their eyelid is the same color as the goddamn circle. Well, he told you wrong. Oh. I did not know. He told me all about it when- and You can tell the animation has gone severely downhill because even in this little still shot of her looking like a meth addict, if you look closer, you can see that the drawing for her left eye is actually on a top layer to her horn, when the horn is a thing that's supposed to be in front of the eye. You see how her eye cuts into the horn, which makes no fapping sense? <laughs> you can even see it happen in real time as I go real slow. Check out her eye. Just keep, just, just keep looking at the right, the, the, the her left eye on our right. Doop, doop. Still in front, then it goes in the back. You can actually see when it goes in front of her horn. Come on now, my lord. Come on. You see Petrie? <laughs> you see how Petrie <laughs> looks like <laughs> You see? Look at look at the quality. Look at the lack of it. His eyelids are the same color. He looks like a New York subway rat that has head caved in by a homeless man's foot. Seriously, what in the Crayola is going on with this franchise? I've seen snippets of the show, and from what I've seen, I know I could be wrong, because they exaggerate their faces too, but at least the animation seems a little bit better than what we're seeing here in the actual roach-stroking movies. Anyways, Ducky's like, I didn't know you had an uncle, and he's like, yeah, well, he went away when I was a baby. And Sarah quickly clears it up and tells the others that Uncle Toronto was actually sent away by the herd. Ha! Huh, you mean he was sent away? <gasps> My father once told me that- Oh my god, her eyelids <laughs> are driving me to the grave for the love of Sesame Street. Will it kill you to keep the characters consistent? <laughs> Petri doesn't like Sarah talking about his uncle this way and he gets kind of defensive and around that time all of them hear some big crashes. Turns out to be a traveling herd entering the Great Valley. You know, so once again here, we have a traveling herd that entering the Great Valley, just like we have Allie's family in Land Before Time 4. A decent sized herd with huge dinosaurs, which really makes me wonder. And you know, some people are saying this was answered. Thank you, phone. Some people were saying this was answered to the show, but I'm sorry, I would like to see the excuse they came up with because in Land Before Time 2, 
Remember when they made the wall to keep out the sharp teeth? I mean, if these guys can come to the Great Valley willy-nilly, there's been a whole bunch of other visitors that can just, you know, come and go as they please. You know what I mean? Bar walkers. Grandpa said we were coming into the wandering time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I looked at all the sauropods, right? I'm sorry, this is so freaking hilarious. Here you have these sauropods that are brown in color. You have this one, this one, this one. Take a look at these two. They're looking all right. They look happy, you know, they're tired, you know, they're whatever, but they're kind of alert, you can tell. They're still all there. <laughs> and then they zoom into the one closest to us. <laughs> the fuck is wrong with him? <laughs> you buddy, you need some rest. The guy needed to get freaking high off his rockers to make this trip. <laughs> Like, I love those little quips that they added. I don't think the animators do that by accident, even though you're like, okay, you, you, you take the time out to do some funny ass shit like that, but you can't get the character's eyelids correctly. But just look at the way he walks by. Everyone else is like, okay, he's like, uh -huh. like <laughs> Oh, I love it so much. Away from the cold lands, looking for food. They know they- <laughs> I want to curb stomp his face right now. I look at it, I just want to curb stomp. Anyway, so Littlefoot says that his grandparents had told him that these herds come away from these cold areas. They come to the, the Great Valley. I guess the Great Valley is like, like a and b or something. You know, bed and breakfasts. Airbnb, come stay here for three, four hours and then be about your- Eat all our food, contribute nothing, and then just leave. And all you leave behind is your piles and piles upon shit. Yeah! With a belly full of our tree stars. Only if you not eat them. <laughs> Stop. Have you noticed this time goes by Sarah devolves into a pancake? Like, I swear, this is something I'd see in a coloring book that you, you buy on the dollar rack and like Rite Aid or something. You know those characters that you know they base on popular franchises, but it's not quite right? Oh, here's a Triceratops. And it happens to look a little bit too much like Sarah from The Land Before Time. Only this is how it comes out looking like. Freaking nastified. So anyways, Littlefoot looks all enamored with the fact that there's new people coming like he's not seen. Herds come into the Great Valley before. His grandmother calls him home. Littlefoot! Littlefoot! Littlefoot, that is your grandma calling. Huh? <laughs> too tired to be doing this. I, I can't. I, I think I need to go to sleep first. I should have gone to sleep before I did this. Yeah, I swear I can make a whole movie out of random pause cuts of Littlefoot and his friends and it just be comedy gold without even having to say anything. God, I I know I'm spending a lot of time on the animation and talking about the animation, but it's so glaring to me. It's so freaking glaring, especially with Sarah and what happened? Oh no. Oh, poor Sarah. <laughs> oh, her dad calls her. Everyone's getting ready to go home. Her eyelids are still not colored in. Oh, what? Well, now they are. So now you remember to color in. Why are you going back? And it's not even, see, this is what I'm talking about. It's not even the whole movie. It's sometimes her eyelids are this way and sometimes they're not. Why? I, I don't know, dude. I don't know. For 98% of the movie, for some odd reason unknown to man, she just looks like a totally different dinosaur. On Sarah's way home, she and Petrie argue about his Uncle Toronto story and whether or not there was actually a world filled with flyers. It's kind of cute to see them do the back and forth dialogue because it actually feels like they've been friends for a long time. <laughs> okay. We know, <laughs> we know what grandpa, what grandpappy and grandmammy look like, right? Why, why is it? Okay, you, you know what? We're gonna let this slide. It's unforgivable, but we're gonna let it slide because right now they look like a pair of sneakers after you put them into the washing machine thinking you were gonna have a great shortcut to washing your shoes only for them to come out looking like menstrual cloth. Littlefoot is sleeping, but then he wakes up after rolling onto a pine cone. Right at that moment, he sees a meteor burning a bright blue as it sails through the atmosphere and lands somewhere nearby. <sighs> Jeez.
Jesus, Mary and Joseph. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. I can't take it anymore. I haven't even started and I feel like, I feel like I'm breaking out into hives. Why is he a goddamn slug right now? Why is he, sh why is he shaping his mouth like that? Look at, look. Ew, you fuck, you look so freaking stupid. Are you preparing to receive Petri's dick? I'm sorry I'm being totally vulgar right now, but seriously, it really, really bothers me to know when, when you have one animation style and the characters that look realistic and then someone takes over and emulsifies the design and makes it look like shea butter. For some reason, when the main characters or when characters in general do their face like this, I want to punch their skull into smithereens. This, th this shot right here, it incites violence. It is not safe for people to watch this. I know y'all think I'm overreacting, but have you ever seen something make a face or look a certain way and for some reason your primitive lizard brain just wants to fuck them up? Like that's what this scene does to me right now. Oh look, another rock shaped like a dinosaur. That's gonna be important later. Notice that's the only one shaped like a dinosaur and that's where the thing decides to land. Did you see it? Are you serious? So, so he has two grandmothers now? <laughs> Every other movie, this is how Gourmet looks. Gourmet is Littlefoot's grandfather. Gourmet is the name that I gave him. Notice, it is so easy to tell the characters apart because this is how they look. Here is a little slideshow, see? Gourmet has that gray top and only white lips and neck and underside. Most of his face is one solid color. Again, there's Gourmet on the left. Again, even though he has a testicle baggage right there, his face is still the same. Maybe they watched the last movie and they're like, oh, he looks like this. No, that was a light from the fire that you would have known that if you actually watched the movie. Berries, again, they can be standing far away and you can tell exactly which one is Gourmet and which one is his wife. Wife? Yellow tan lips, gourmet, light bottom jaw. This is how it has been from the freaking first movie and all the other movies after this, from Land Before, from, 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 from Land Before Time, one to six, you know? And then in this one, they're like, you know what? Just because. Why does he look like this? Why are they messing up the character designs? It shouldn't bother me, but it does. I know you're probably thinking, geez, Altiori, you're freaking insane. Seriously, I think I am. But to me, it's no different than taking Super Mario and giving him a pointy nose instead. We're making, or making the M on his hat an N or an O. Is it too much to ask to just keep the characters consistent? Maybe it's my OCD going off the charts or something, but it is flipping aggravating. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? Oh, wasn't what amazing, little foot? The way that thing flew across- Oh my god, I can't. Oh, I cannot. It's one thing for us to poke fun at the glaring mistakes in one or two scenes in a movie, you know? But when it's a reoccurring theme throughout the entire movie, it's unforgivable. Like, you can't tell without the voices, you can't tell which one's which. That's not- Like, how, how lazy, how lazy do you have to be to work on the seventh movie in the franchise and not know how the characters it's about to look? It's like- that does this one in the last few. Nobody at any point in time realized what the hell. <sighs> Let me calm down. And that light and that noise and and you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guy. Who is who? Who is who? What the? You freaking buckskin Christmas blankets. They're the same character. Ew. Freaking comforters. So Littlefoot's grandparents don't believe him or they're just really upset that he woke them up for basically nothing. So the next morning, all the adults are gathered in one place. The grandparents call over Littlefoot to ask him about last night. Littlefoot, we need to talk. No. Oh my God. No! <laughs> So apparently, Gourmet has a new look, but it's not how he looks. You know who Gourmet was for all this time. This is how he looks like now, guys. This is what he looks like now. That's how he looks now. That, that, that's what we're working with because nobody watched the previous movies before designing him for this one. Damn! About what? About what you saw last night. What the fuck? Camel testicles on a goat saddle, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> ugliest I've ever seen his grandparents, I swear to God. You see, dear, word has gotten around. And it's made some of our guests a bit- 
why did they have Ducky's mother pop in like that all unnatural like? I hate when you have movies or TV shows or kids shows where one person says something and the script calls for someone else to cut them off to continue the sentence. For which in the scene, totally unnecessary. But Mihor literally waits for Ducky's mom to cut in and it sounds so unnatural. Maybe a baby won't think anything of it because, you know, they don't talk yet. But it's so glaringly obvious to me. Not to mention how some of the dinosaurs are standing in one position, you know? Based on what we're seeing, one Ceratopsian standing in one position only for additional dinosaurs to appear like this guy and this guy or just straight up disappear. Where are the two green dinos that were standing there only moments ago? Anyway, while all this is going on, these rainbow faces, who I'm guessing are the Gallimimus species, walk into the middle of the herd and are basically insulting them, saying that if they don't see something with their eyes, it doesn't exist, which makes no sense because apparently that's limited thinking. While I see where they're coming from, they come off as the scientists of the show. However, that's the most unscientific thing I have ever heard. The whole point of science is to keep an open mind, yes, but not believing until you have evidence. You can theorize, but why would you believe something if you have no evidence for it? It's perfectly logical for you to say that you don't believe in something if you don't see it. Like, I can say I have six fingers on one hand or one paw, or I can fly, and I may be telling the truth or I might not. It is well within your rights, if that's not the norm, and it's outside the realm of anything you've ever known, to say that you don't believe it exists until it's proven, or to you, or the vast majority. Should. I mean, what if the little long neck did see something extraordinary? Miraculous. Impossible. So this is basically Littlefoot seeing the burning bush and everyone should just believe him even though he's the only one who saw it. Nobody else can back up his claim. And while Littlefoot has no right to lie, he's the only person who claimed to have seen it when everyone was supposedly asleep. You know, they make very good points because if you haven't seen everything, then you can't know everything. If you haven't seen a killer whale, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But then again, we have proof that it exists. And then there's another thing that, well, they can doctor photos and whatnot, but it's widely known that it exists. Then again, you have many religions who believe that certain gods exist and nobody's ever seen them. There's a difference. There are pictures and video, live video, of killer whales existing. We know how video cameras work. It's much easier to doctor a photo than it is to do a video. There are also places where you can go to prove it to yourself that these things are real. If someone goes to Mars, like part of the colony that's supposed to go there, and they're like, yo guys, we have some look pearlescent looking killer whales here. No, well, that's great, but I'm gonna hold out a little bit of skepticism until I see some photos or until I see some videos. It's never gonna be real to me because I have no proof. Possible. Really? Have you really seen all there is to see? Are there no mysteries left for you? <gasps> well, well, um, um, no. Oh, he got really, like, damn. Were you surprised when she touched you like that? What the hell? <laughs> it was like, <gasps> shit, I've not been touched like that in a while. That was, it's like he didn't even know what to do with himself. Look at she comes over to him and touches him with his lips, like. Have you really seen all there is to see? Are there no mysteries left for you? <gasps> You touched my no-no. It felt great. Oh, God damn it. I'd touch more than that if my husband would let me. Oh, give me a break. Give me a break. The rainbow face couple start singing the song Beyond the mysterious beyond Out where the wonders are the rarest I really, really love this song. Like, especially me who loves space and cosmic stuff like that, which is, I was like, yay, even though this movie's very corny, but yay. And it's this whole Bill Nye the Science Guy thing, but it's so annoying the way it happens. And I'll tell you why near the end, because she teases it like, oh, we know, we want you to know, but we can't tell you, but, but yeah, but we can't. Like, and the other guy wants to tell him, but I guess she's like, no, they're not ready for that yet. But it's so annoying because they basically force it there. It's just, it's just the things they say. You'll see. Yeah. I do love the song. So all of them are singing about the universe or whatever, and they don't know what's out there, but there's something out there that they don't know anything about. And remember that green horned dinosaur, the green ceratops, or rather the two of them? Yeah, once again, these joints are missing. I don't see them anywhere, do you? I'm sorry, but what are you saying? <laughs> I just love how he does this. I'm like, 
like that because seriously, they just came out of nowhere and started singing about nothing really. This entire scene lasted like 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but I, I was going past it for a while and it starts from like, it just lasts a lot, like at least five minutes. At least. But that was the whole premise of them singing the song because Littlefoot saw something and then I shit you not. The entire premise for the movie is them saying, What if this was no ordinary flying rock? What if it was, for example, a stone of cold fire? <sighs> oh look, look who showed up again for a scene. So that's the entire premise of the movie. That's why the movie has a title that it does. What if it was a stone of cold fire? Like people are supposed to know what that was. Like they've heard it in stories and now there's a possibility it's a reality. It just feels so out of place. Glad you asked. Some say that these stones can shine light without heat. Some believe they can give powers far beyond our comprehension. Why does she sound like Pill Bayesian from Last Man on Earth? Seriously, I feel like this is a filler episode to an anime and not the fun slice of life kind either. Just a cringy waste of time episode that you're painfully aware of it being a filler episode. So anyway, there's this male pteranodon in the distance in the shadows and it turns out to be Petrie's uncle. Fascinating. <laughs> First, a flying rock is a flying rock. Second, fire can't be cold. And so understandably, Mr. Tops tells off the rainbow faces because to him, they are kooky crazy people that just came out of nowhere and it's heavily implied that they are aliens. If you haven't caught that on by now, then you need to be eating more Eggo waffles and increase the amount of foals in your brain because they basically beat you over the head with it for the entire movie. So based on what he says, Mr. Tops doesn't want these weirdos making their kids crazy too. There's nothing wrong with having an open mind, but he's very pragmatic and he thinks it's a waste of time. There is nothing beyond the mysterious beyond. I think this is what I remembered after he said this, that the mysterious beyond is not the place right after the Great Valley, but basically everywhere that's not the Great Valley, like the whole planet. And even still, that makes no sense to me because you know they've been out there. I don't really understand why everything beyond the Great Valley would all be mysterious because you lived out there. You traveled for many kilometers across a lot of it. Not everything, but it's weird because when they leave the Great Valley, only like a few steps outside the wall, the mysterious beyond. And I'm like, I thought it was like a swamp area that they're not supposed to go to, but no, it turns out in the rest of the movies, it's just everywhere else. It's not the Great Valley. But is that really that mysterious? Y'all were out there before, especially the grown-ups. Why is it so mysterious to you? It's that. No. But. I'm sorry, Littlefoot. But until the far walk. Did Gourmet get a facial? It's still bothering me, but they wiped his pigment off the whole top half of his face. Maybe he's experimenting. Maybe he wants to look younger. And during all of this, the couple, Rainbow Faces, take a liking to Littlefoot because he is so inquisitive. After the meeting is disbanded, Sarah's dad basically tells everyone to chill out with the magic rock talk. Gourmet tells Littlefoot very quietly that he should probably lay off that kind of talk for a while. All the kids forget about it, but Littlefoot just can't keep his mind off it. Littlefoot knows what he saw and wishes everyone believed him. I like to see how Ducky tries to make sense of it because she's like, it doesn't make any sense, bro. Only, um, Littlefoot? Well, I think there can be a stone in a fire and a stone that is cold. But how can a stone that is cold be on fire? You know, at least give credit where credit's due. And, I, you know, that the kids, they can think in regards to this because in their minds, as far as they know, fire cannot be cold. That's all they know. And so it makes no sense when one person says they saw something that was essentially a cold fire, an element that cannot be cold. I mean, when we're talking about the coolest fire, unless I don't know something yet, it hasn't been proven yet, not to me anyway, not that I heard of. We're talking about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which would blast her skin off to smithereens. When Sarah says that she'd want to see the stone for herself. That's it. Oh boy, here we go. That would prove I was telling the truth. But, but, but you hear grown-ups smoking mountains too dangerous. Nonsense. And then we meet Uncle Toronto. It's honestly so cute to see Petrie love his uncle so much. He didn't even remember him because he was a little wee baby when he saw him. So he doesn't recognize his uncle at first. But then he's like, I'm hurt. You don't remember me? Understandably, Toronto left when he was little. He went out to get some tit milk and never returned. Toronto is probably the father figure that Petrie remembers. And it's so obvious that the uncle has ulterior motives for getting close to Petrie and Littlefoot. Toronto wants to find the stone to convince others that Littlefoot was telling the truth. But for his own reasons, and right around that time, Littlefoot gets freaked out. Out. To convince everyone else is, as you say, to go and find that stone. Uh, I wasn't serious. I was just 
thinking out loud. Anyway, uh, we were about to go home. He is coming on a bit strong. They don't trust adults when they're going on their adventures because this random guy like, hugging up on them and stuff. It's freaking creepy, I will admit. What makes it creepier is two other villainous looking flyers pop in. I love how Petrie wants to stay with his uncle. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, we gotta go. And Petrie's like, I'll stay here with Uncle Toronto. <laughs> Sarah is like, hey, me stay here with Uncle Toronto. Petrie, it's time to go. I love Sarah. Oh my God, that's why I love her so much. She is like, no, we're leaving. As mean as she can be sometimes, she's a good big sister and a good friend because Sarah, she's also my imaginary best friend. She can be the one who'd be like, we need to leave. Wait, can we just, yo, huh, let's go. We need to leave. Remember that thing that we have? <laughs> that is exactly her personality. I don't know why this, whatever the hell he is, reminds me of uh, freaking... Sawyer from Lost. Them brats wasn't falling for your little act. I said we'd go find that cold fire thingy on our own. So Toronto really believes that this thing has freaking powers. Littlefoot goes and tells his ugly ass grandparents or his freaking Coraline imposter grandparents about what happened. And then Gourmet loses his shit. Huh. We could see just fine. As a matter of fact, we saw right through him. Oh my God, Grandpa, calm down. Put your sheath back in your body. Toronto obviously did something really bad. Even Migor is like, dude, you haven't even seen him. <laughs> And you're already worked up. And you're wondering the whole time, what did he do so bad that caused everyone to banish him? Gourmet says that if they hadn't, they hadn't gone away from that guy, they probably wouldn't have made it to the Great Valley. Toronto is telling Petrie and his siblings, I keep forgetting to see Petrie and his siblings, it's so weird. I like how every time you look at them, they're all like desaturated and Petrie is the only one that's solid because he's the only one that we're supposed to care about. Does he have like all brothers and there's that one sister that looks like she's a freaking slut? Answer, anyway, Pamela, sorry, it was her name. I, I, there was another name I thought I had called her, but I named Petrie's mom Pamela. Calls her children in back to the nest. They all say they want to be like their uncle when they grow up. He tells them to mind their mother and to keep out of trouble. And the mother gives him an underhanded like, yeah, uh-huh, let's do that. When Petrie's about to join his siblings, his uncle holds him back. He asks him to do a favor, a harmless favor. And the next morning when Petrie's with his friends, Oh! <laughs> Oh. Ah! But that's the way the rock rolls. And speaking of rock, say, how about that stone of cold fire, huh? He looks like a meth addict trying to spin a sod sob story so that they can get you to give them money for drugs. So am I. We're gonna see some skin tonight. <laughs> yeah, scars and all. Petrie's like, look. I was just thinking about it, and it could be fun, you know, whatever, while being hella suspicious, and Sarah calls his bullshit, because she's like, it sounds like your Uncle Toronto is the one who wants to know about it, huh? Oh, yes, no, well, maybe him too, but honest, me, <laughs> Adri! <laughs> okay. Littlefoot apologizes to Petrie and says, yeah, my grandparents told me to watch out for him. And honestly, sometimes your uncle uses words to trick you. And this really offends Petrie because it seems that everybody else is against his uncle except for him. Sarah says that my dad says that you can tell a lot about the quality of someone by the friends that they keep. And then Petrie, being sorely offended by this, even though at least Sarah's eyelids look okay in the scene, replies that he is in big trouble because of the friends that he keeps. Me in trouble, cause my friends acting like stink bugs. <laughs> Petrie. This is one of the only times and one of the only movies where I feel relatable to Petrie because I actually feel bad seeing him sad. Like seeing him look up to someone and nobody else likes him. Seeing how naive he is because that's his uncle, that's his blood. He's the only other male figure he has in his life because maybe you haven't noticed, but Petrie has no father. And once again, Sarah's freaking eyelids have gone on vacation. While Petrie's off by himself crying, it's so creepy because when you see it, you'll shit yourself. His uncle is there. Can you see where his uncle is? Surprise! Uncle Toronto hugs Petrie and tells Petrie to tell him everything of what happened. At nighttime, all the hers are sleeping right next to each other, which is weird. I mean, I guess the newcomers sleep next to Ducky's mom and Spike and them, and I never really thought about it because I always thought them having their own, like, nests. But it's really 
cool and realistic to see her, Miss Yushin, sleeping with a whole bunch of other people around her. Also, people said she's a parasaurolophus. No, she's not. The things that are on the back end of her and the front those are parasaurolophus. She's a saurolophus or something else. You can see her mouth is a lot larger and the horn a lot smaller than what a parasaurolophus is supposed to look like. I cannot sleep. No, I am not hungry. I am worried about Petrie. I do like the night scenes. I remember when we saw this at first. I think it was in the fourth Land Before Time. And there's something about seeing them at home at night talking to each other that just makes me all warm inside because it makes them feel like real characters. In my Land Before Time audio fan fiction, Spike and Ducky have a very complicated relationship. They're brother and sister, but it's more of like a sibling rivalry. As Spike gets older, he can talk. He's very super smart. And he keeps calling out Ducky for all her bad decisions. And he just becomes a bit of a brat, but she's also a brat in her own Right? But there is one specific show that I did that had like 20 chapters where something happens. I don't want to spoil it because I might put that one up too. And Sarah and, and Spike and Ducky actually stop fighting each other because they both have something to lose. And you could tell in that moment that they love each other. They just don't often show it. Here, it's really cool because she's picked up Spike's language and she can understand certain things that he says, even though he doesn't outright talk. And just seeing that between them is so special. If it's one thing that they get right, at least so far with the movie, is that the dialogue feels as though these characters are actually friends or actually brothers and sisters and the way they talk to each other it doesn't feel all cringe induced like you're forcing people to have a relationship it feels like they actually have a relationship. Ducky says that she doesn't like the fact that they made Petrie feel bad and friends shouldn't make each other feel like that. She's gonna find Petrie and make it better. She's totally an ESFP. So she goes off to try and find Petrie. While she's looking for Petrie she overhears the flyers talking. Apparently at night people turn completely different colors if you're red, you're now completely green. It's, it's the weirdest thing ever. Yes, that is Toronto in the middle right there. And this part makes no sense to me because they're all, they have this diabolical plan. And instead of going in the tree some, some distance away where no one can hear them, they talk mad loud in the middle of the herd of dinosaurs sleeping. I know. Yes, with half the Great Valley right on our tails. Why would they come after us? The young ones have told their parents that they have seen me. If we leave in a hurry, they might think that we are up to no good. You're talking mad loud in the middle of the herd. Look at all the, your flyers. There are so many other places you could go to have this fucking conversation. But you choose in the middle of the sleeping herd of dinosaurs that would want nothing more than to stomp your brains in if they even have an inkling of you being up to no good. Given your history, it makes no sense. It feels like horrible writing that they put this in just so Ducky could walk over and see them. Are you not afraid that somebody will wake up and hear you? Like, I just don't get it. It's not even like, even if they didn't have wings, it wouldn't make any sense. Because you could go somewhere far away. The kids have enough sense to go somewhere far away to have a conversation. Sarah and Littlefoot, when they're getting their friends together, pull their friends away from their sleeping nest and go somewhere away to have a conversation. And they whisper. But these guys that have wings where they can fly wherever they want, on the top of the mountain, in the freaking background, decide to have this conversation at the decibel at which I'm speaking while everyone is sleeping like yeah so little so, so Ducky's like I gotta go tell little foot and she's whispering mad loud too and the flyer heard her and yeah okay you, you should have mind your own business Ew. <sighs> <sighs> They grab Ducky, and Toronto's not really happy about this. They fly away with her, and her screams cause everyone to wake up. Yeah, the loud-ass conversation didn't. Everyone's freaking out because they think there's a sharp tooth, but they can't see any sharp tooth. Littlefoot tells Petrie that Toronto is taking Ducky away. Petrie doesn't believe him at first. He actually had the gall to ask, where is she going? When you can see that Ducky is being carried. Wrong! Toronto never do- No, Petrie. It's true. It is Toronto. No. <laughs> the 
look at Littlefoot's face. It looks like he got stung by a freaking diabolical wasp. While they're all flying away, he lets them know, don't hurt Ducky. Petrie goes after him and asks why he's doing this. But the others beat him away. And I guess Petrie can't fly once he's falling. Toronto slaps a flyer and tells him that he shouldn't have done that. See how they're flying right now? See how they're flying above all of that? They couldn't have done that for the meeting. Had they done that, Ducky would not be in danger. And had it not been for Littlefoot, Petrie apparently would have died. Because as he's falling, he does not know how to spread his wings. And like, you've fallen before and was able to pick yourself up. You've also known how to get out of the water before when you're swimming. You can't, in this specific instance, open your wings when you're falling from such a height. First of all, the resistance should make you fall a little less, especially if your wings are out. Because somebody, let's, let's not forget, this is the same Petrie who can be blown away to the other side of a room by somebody breathing on him. Keep that in mind. Yet the wind resistance of you falling does nothing. Okay. You've also been seen in other movies opening up your wings when you're falling. You forgot how to do that from, from such a very high height, really? Okay. Whatever. You fall in water, and it's not like you're unconscious. It doesn't- you, Littlefoot pulls him out and he's totally fine. He knows how to swim. We've seen him swim before and play in the water with his friend. You forgot how to swim? You weren't unconscious, so you could have pulled yourself back up. So, I- whatever. <laughs> Archaeopteryx. At least that's what I think it is. Oh, and I've seen these dinosaurs throughout too. The Oranosauruses, the duck bill looking dinosaurs with the spines on their back. Pretty cool. And I will say that this is the movie where I've seen the most variety in dinosaurs. So the grown-ups all gather around because now Ducky is taken. Now this is a really, really huge deal. Denise Yushin, Ducky's mom. It's not her official name. It's just the name I gave her. It's freaking out. Except that the person who voice acts her doesn't really do a great job. Look, those flyers have taken my daughter and I want her back before... before... <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny, but it is. I don't know why it's funny. It's not, because she's... I just... Okay, I don't... I don't believe her. Stop crying, you have 16 other children. Don't worry. My brother may be many bad things, but he would never let those others harm her. Go, Pam. This is the most I've heard Petrie's mom speak. This movie is the first time I've actually heard her say multiple sentences. <laughs> so this next part is hilarious because Mr. Tops is like, yo, Toronto was back. Why did anyone tell me, tell me that Toronto was talking to the young ones? And then he redirects his train of thought to Sarah as though she's supposed to know because they never told any of the kids about this. Like Sarah only overheard it, but it's not like he drove it home to them. Maybe he expected her to say, I'm pretty sure he probably told her the whole story, knowing how Mario is, but poor Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, you're responsible to tell me everything that happens. Daddy. Sarah? Yo, fucking tell you, don't do that shit. No fucking. I, I thought you would be angry. Angry? Angry? Oh, I'm not <laughs> angry. I'm furious! <laughs> Wait, they all run away. Daddy, chill. Oh, look at Kentrosaurus over there. Then Migor is like, look, we gotta, you know, we, we gotta say something after Littlefoot finally says, yo, what's going on? Nobody ever tells us anything. And if they want the kids to be responsible, they should share some things with them that's important for their survival. Like somebody who was responsible for killing half of the herd, which is exactly what Pam shares. <laughs> They all tell the story about how Toronto was with the herd. And he thought he was the best, the smartest, and all of that. He was a complete narcissist. And everybody listened to him, except for some of the people of the Great Valley. Petrie tries to make an excuse of why Toronto thought he was better than the others by saying that, you know, he is a flyer, so maybe Uncle Toronto could see stuff that the others couldn't see. He's like, listen, this is the way to the Great Valley, and he kept on pushing others onward. But you know what? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree because just like his nephew, apparently flying doesn't do jack for them because even though he was flying above and leading them, apparently he missed that there were a group of sharp teeth that were gonna come after them, looking like freaking mothballs. The herd tried to fight the sharp teeth away, but what ended up happening is that the sharp teeth ganged up on all the herd, which is so unrealistic. Chased them everywhere, a lot of them got hurt, Toronto did nothing, and a Parasaurolophus slipped and fell to her death. And instead of taking responsibility, he just flew away and left them to die. When he came back, he tried telling them what happened and that it wasn't his fault, yada, yada, yada. But he never actually said what happened to them. And we never saw any of the others again.
But he right. It's not his fault others not know how to fly away. Wow. That's so ignorant. He never told us why it happened. Only that it wasn't his fault. Petrie's so freaking dumb. I know he's thinking like, yeah, you know, in his flyer mind, they should know how to fly. But Petrie knows it's not realistic because there's time when he's like, oh, I can fly, sucks to be you. And he completely forgets that everybody else can't. Like, I know his head is the smallest, but come on, Petrie. And so here we go. Here's another thing that just annoys me. Because Littlefoot's grandma comes in and says, look, regardless of everything that happened, he's still not to be trusted. Let's hear what she has to say. Nevertheless, it was his fault. What the heck? That is not Littlefoot's grandmother. That is not his grandma. Oh my God, there's so much going on in this image. I can't even like... Nevertheless. Shut up! a gag for real now okay you leave the bed sheet looking thing mask looking thing on grandpa's face when he's not supposed to have it. it's not his character and then you're like let's make it purple to, to match the rest of his underside no you know what let's again in the daytime make him look exactly like his wife why why is this why is this happening it was his fault that they got into such danger a real leader must be willing to shut the hell up you freaking skits Long next. I don't even know if you're the same people anymore. So everyone has his history with Toronto, okay? And aside from the whole bleached face gourmet, for some reason it having the poor thing, every time it's ball bag skin on his neck, it's looking like his freaking wife, whatever. They're all arguing amongst themselves because Toronto really did a number on them and they really hate him. Like these people hold grudges. Like, no tomorrow. And then Miss Yushin has enough. Not Toronto, oh no. He just kept changing his story and lying and scheming and- Quiet, quiet! We all know what happened before. Right now, somebody has got to go rescue my little ducky. Why don't you rescue her, mother? Isn't she your child? What in the ass? What? Okay, everyone is sitting here arguing. She's your child. What fucking, sorry, what madre would sit there as her hija is off getting taken away by somebody who is responsible for killing other dinosaurs or at least having some indirect responsibility for killing other dinosaurs in the past. Why would you have that person take her with some other villainous reptiles, sorry, and you not be one of the first ones to go after her? Like everybody else, Sarah's father, Littlefoot's grandparents, Petrie's mom, everybody else fights for their children. And your entitled ass is like, someone needs to go save my daughter. Excuse me. Where's your husband, ma'am? Where's your herd? What about you? Last time I checked, your legs are working perfectly fine. They're long and slender and alien looking as F. You go save her. You're, she's your child. What in the uselessness baking soda is going on with this dinosaur? I cannot stand her. Oh my God. Like, and I, in my stories, I like Mrs. Yushin. I do like her, but she's just as dumb. She has, she's the dumbest. She's sweet and she's a good mom in terms of like raising her children, sort of. But she's freaking crack, heady, crack it lackily stupid. Even when I was watching this the first time, that was my first thought. Why didn't you go save her, bitch? I would have been dumb. You think I would wait for people to go save? I don't have actual children, but I have my dogs. You think you need to tell me twice? Somebody takes my dog, I'd be out there in my bare feet and my freaking shotgun chasing down whoever it is so they can drop my fucking dog. Like, no one has to tell me that. What is wrong with Mr. Chops' horns? What? What is that? Are they in a ponytail? Why, are, why does the base look like that? You know what? You should get a friend that has OCD. Like, I, 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 I don't consider myself to have it, but if it bothers me, holy mess. I'm so, so curious to see see how they would react. Because, dude, 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 what in the baking soda and lemon juice is going on? It's almost like they do this crap on purpose. Oh, yeah. See? His horns don't have fucking white but Whether or not I believe there is such a thing as a stone of cold fire, that is where they will go. I like how the <laughs> I like how the random dinosaur in the back is just like, just standing there like. 
Bağa bak Rakun. Bağa bir daha bağırırsan seni kulaklarından duvara çivilen. So Hulk was all excited because yay he gets to lead the people there. And then right after they say that the grown ups are still all standing there arguing. <gülüyor> Why are they? Why are they? <sighs> this is so badly written. So badly written. Uh, oh my god, my head. My head is starting to go. I'm trying to push through so we don't have a part two. But dude, man, little foot, your mouth. Your mouth needs to be fixed. Your head's facing away from us, but your bottom jaw is facing towards us. Pager feels guilty. Sarah with her stupid dumbass missing eyelids is like, yeah, it is your fault. Then Spike gets upset and he's like, you know what? To hell with everybody. I'm gonna go and find my big sister. After drawing her in the sand. It looks like a freaking, you know those Pokemon that look like symbols? The rainbow faces are watching them and excited to see what they're gonna do. The flyers are still on their way to Three Horn Peak. Still carrying Ducky. After they start fighting, Ducky manages to get away. <laughs> And they're like, we're gonna get you, bitch! And she's like, no! And right in the nick of time, she drops through an area into like this cave. Toronto feels guilty because he thinks that Ducky is dead. He tries calling after her, but it's such a deep fall. And no answer makes him believe that she's gone. His cowboy friend is like, you should be used to this kind of thing by now, dude. Like rubbing salt in the wound. They fly away and it turns out that Ducky is just fine. Hanging on to one of the stalactites. I forgot what they're called. It breaks off and she falls off into the water. Meanwhile, her friends are hot on the trail. And once again, like in every freaking movie in every Land Before Time movie there is a gaping chasm and they have to find a way to pass and they gotta use a log or a vine or some stones. Sarah is like uh, okay every time that happens I have to be at the back. This time I'm going in the front which is very stupid because if there's danger in the front well you're dead. Spike knows he has to rescue his sister. He cares about her right? And these vines are very soft like this is not this is not safe. Relax. <laughs> <sighs> so freaking stupid. You're trying to rescue your sister. Spike, you're not that stupid that you don't know if you eat through something that's holding you up that you're gonna fall off of it. I just don't, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Maybe Spike is retarded. I don't know. What does give me joy though is that my character for Spike in the Land Before Time parody is the kind of person that would watch a movie like this and he would say literally in his little voice, what the fuck are you doing? Did you fall out of your mother's ass? onto your head as a baby. You should be shot before you're allowed to procreate. That's the kind of thing he would say. And it would drive him insane. And I love it. It's so satisfying for me. Because I don't get that kind of satisfaction from this. Every single one of the characters can't all be stupid. At varying levels. Like, no! no! Hang on! No! <laughs> so long. I wonder if I should do another part two. I don't know, man. There's just so much, there's just so much to love. I told you! And we don't know if they make it. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and split this up into a part two. <laughs> of course they make it. They're the main characters, but somebody might get hurt. <gasps> or do they? We never know, right? I love trolling people. It's great. Anyways, for those of you who have seen this, do you think that this is the this might be the best Land Before Time, or the worst, depending on your point of view or your mood at the time you're watching it. But holy mess, man. Holy, holy cow patties. I think that this is the best Land Before Time in terms of the idiocracy that is the writing for the script. But one of the worst movies. But one of the best relatable, I don't know. Dude, the, these are all in a category by themselves. I love these freaking things, man. I love this franchise so much. As much as I get mad at it, it is something that will always be a part of my childhood. And I just love it. I love it. It's it's, it's freaking crazy. It's so annoying. Anywho, these creatures are called Regalops or Region Walkers. These are all-terrain creatures that can walk walk for weeks at a time. They're one of the only known creatures whose digestive system can work in reverse. Instead of chewing their cud, they will fully digest their food to the best of their ability. And when it reaches to the end of their digestive tract where they're usually supposed to poo it out, it will go in the opposite direction and reabsorb whatever so that it can go up to their throat so they can masticate it again, chew on it, re-swallow it, re-digest it, over and over again to last them for weeks without food. 
You may be wondering, what do they do with all the toxins? Well, they pee it out. Most animals in the area have the ability, like us, to pee and to poo, but with them, they mostly pee, only pooing like probably once a month or once every two months, depending on how long they go without food. Also, they do the same for water, so if they're in an area where there's not a lot of water or green, they could just squeeze out the last of the water molecules from whatever they re-digest. And by the time they have fully digested whatever it is, they're, they're digesting for like the sixth time, it comes out as this weird ashy powdery substance because they essentially can suck all of the water matter out of anything that they digest repeatedly. They're not very fast, but oh boy, do they have endurance. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulturi. You ask, we answer.